Hello and welcome to the 24-7 Sports Football Recruiting Podcast. I'm National Recruiting Analyst Cooper Patenga alongside 24-7 Sports Director of Scouting Andrew Ivins. And uh, it might be April 9th, but college football, man, even coming off the heels of the national championship, college basketball, shout out to UConn. Still a lot to talk about, Drew. We got spring games. We got the Elite 11 Oxford recap as well. We got commitments flying off the board. The transfer portal getting ready to get going as that opens up April 16th. Next Tuesday, we'll talk about that later in the show. But, Drew, uh, no shortage of, of headlines in terms of things kind of happening and transpiring in all of college football. Um, you brought it up before the show. I mean, we got to talk about it. What do you think about Auburn to Nike? I, I don't know, man. I don't. I mean, brand deals. Who does Under Armour have left, right? They got Notre Dame, Maryland, Hawaii, Utah. Am I missing anyone? Does this matter? In terms of what? Like recruiting? and yeah, I, I think it matters in terms of – let me rephrase that. Does it matter in terms of recruiting? I'm not sure. I don't, I don't yeah, think it okay, really matters. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in terms of like, hey, if I'm an Auburn fan, I'm excited. You know, that's a premier brand in, in all of college football and all of sports is Nike. Uh, so it's going to be interesting. Cincinnati was another Under Armour school that has recently uh, transitioned to Nike as well. So we'll see. Under Armour's kind of a little bit, uh, I don't want to say on the hot seat, but, you know, kind of examining them going forward. You're selling stock. <laughs> literally, and, <laughs> literally and figuratively. But we're, we're not here to talk about Under Armour or Nike. We're here to talk about uh, college football recruiting. And let's start at the top. Your boy here was in Oxford, Mississippi over the weekend. I'll tell you this, beautiful town. Really enjoyed it. Uh, had a great time um, walking around the city a little bit. Brought the wife with me. Not one of those trips where you're like, hey, destination spot, Oxford, Mississippi. But I enjoyed it. Uh, and guess what? There were some players there in attendance, not only quarterbacks, uh, offensive linemen as well. We'll talk about those guys a little bit later. But the alpha dog, Deuce Knight. Uh, and Drew, I wrote it in the recap continues to kind of cement himself, at least at the quarterback position, I think is the most intriguing name of the bunch. When you think of the kid, obviously starts his career at uh, Loosedale in Mississippi, transfers to Lipscomb Academy in Tennessee, transfers back to Loosedale in Mississippi last year as a junior, completed only 50% of his passes in seven games last season. But then you kind of look at the uh, physical traits of a guy like Deuce Knight, 6'4 plus, 200 pounds. He's got a low 4'5", 40 to his name. He also jumped uh, over 40-inch vertical as well. He's an explosive, dynamic player. And, Drew, he's still putting it together. Uh, This was his most encouraging performance that I think we've seen over the last two years. And And we've gotten to see him multiple times in the camp circuit. If I'm a Notre Dame fan right now, uh, I got to be really, really excited about the future of Deuce Knight, not only because of the potential of the player, but I love the way he fits in the room, right? I mean, you think about Riley Leonard this year, you think about next year, what that looks like. You still have Steven Jelly, you have Kenny Minchie, and you have CJ Carr, uh, right, where there are a lot of expectations there. It kind of allows for a guy like Deuce Knight to just settle in and not have the immediate pressure of having to play early. And I think Deuce Knight, at the end of the day, is going to be a slow burn. This is going to be a guy that's going to need two years of on-field development until you can really kind of see him getting considerable snaps or competing for a starting job. So as of right now, Drew, the fit uh, not only on the field but off the field right now with Deuce Knight and Notre Dame uh, is really one of my favorites in the class. Well, Marcus Freeman's got the luxury of being able to put him in the uh, crock pot, right? Just set it for two years and see what he looks like. Uh, notable, I mean, punches this ticket to the Elite 11 Finals. Cooper, I read your story. You did a great job uh, recapping everything that happened there uh, in Oxford. Let me ask you this. It's early. I think we're only at, what, five Elite 11 invites have gone out for the finals. They're going to get up to 20, a few more regionals. Uh, then Brian Stump and those guys are going to get back together and hand out the final ones. Is he kind of like the DJ Lagway of the 2025 cycle in terms of, all right, we can see the ceiling, you know, what we see the floor. I think we had had the same feeling about DJ Lagway coming into last summer's event. You know, he was 10 and 10 as a starter. 
Um, statistically not what you want him to be. Now, Deuce, I think, is a little bit better in that sense. Uh, is, is it safe to say he's kind of the DJ Lagway? We had to put him in a category or in a, in a neighborhood? Very comparable. I think DJ had put more on tape um, before his senior season. I think there was a little bit more on-field contextually that you felt good about. Um, and you think about our rankings and how they project to the NFL draft, that's what we try to do every show is continue to kind of tie those two together. And you think about... Deuce Knight right now at number 129, he would really be in the middle of the fourth round, right? So if you were going to take a developmental passer, a guy that could sit for a year or two, not have immediate returns in terms of the expectations, that's kind of where Deuce Knight would fit in in that category. I was telling a friend today on the collegiate personnel side, he was asking about Deuce Knight, and I said, you know, fast forward four or five years, and let's say we have to put on our NFL GM cap, Deuce Knight would be the guy that everybody's doing homework on, right? Because in terms of the physical ability, and I keep talking about that, it's really difficult to find. And then you see the flashes as a passer as well. The thing that intrigues me about Deuce Knight is from a coaching standpoint, he's got a long way to go in terms of consistency with the footwork as well. Uh, and, And then just slowing down the game, which comes from reps, Drew, I really kind of see that more as a positive at this point, right? That just tells me that this player has not kind of received that coaching that ultimately can take him to the next level uh, once he gets to a college campus. So, um, yeah, if there's a guy right now uh, that can really take the escalator up, uh, maybe up our board, right, over the next couple of months, I think Deuce Knight is one of those names that you have to ask for. Well, we've talked about, right, you got the big four, uh, Bryce Underwood, Tavian St. Clair, George McIntyre, Julian Lewis. And then we got that chase pack, and it's been Hassan Longstreet, Matt Zollers, Keelan Russell, I think Antoine uh, Smith, or Antoine Hill, excuse me, has been in that conversation. Sounds like you want to put Deuce Knight. He has joined the chase is what you're kind of hinting at. Am I getting those vibes? He's, he's on the, like... He's kind of like in that Luke Cromenhawk category of like, hey, this is a guy that we're going to have to monitor, like in terms of whether Deuce Knight is going to, you know, take a rocket ship up into the top 32. I'm not really sure about that. But in terms of uh, maybe putting together a really productive senior season, uh, taking a step up in some areas that we want to see him improve, especially completion rate. Somebody asked this morning, why is he not a five-star? And we typically get these questions. Well, like I said, he only had a 50% completion rate last year, right? So there is a part of the puzzle that is pretty incomplete that we're still trying to figure out with Deuce Knight. He's got to put it together on the field. And although there's been flashes, he's still a ways away from that. So for us, Drew, um, like I said, we got him in the fourth round. Speaking in NFL terms, I think this is a guy that can certainly press uh, into that top 64 range. Uh, and I'm going to be intrigued kind of like at the end of the year, what's he going to look like in a postseason setting if we're going to be able to see him? I'm not sure whether he's committed to the he All-American is, Bowl or you not. He's not in any games yet. So – you know, if, if he does end up in one of those games, good on good setting. We talk about that a lot. That will be uh, another opportunity. Um, Drew, another uh, quarterback at top of the board, George McIntyre was there, number 10 quarterback, or excuse me, number 10 player overall, number three quarterback in the country. And you talk about a guy that, I don't know, what would you call it, a tricky evaluation? Um, sticky. You, sticky. Sticky, tricky, whatever you want to call it. Six five and a half, 190 pounds, two-sport athlete. And what was interesting when I was riding him up, I'm like, man, he's got such a long way to go from a physical uh, trajectory standpoint. And I'm trying to think in my head, like, all right, who's come out recently uh, that kind of emulates George McIntyre a little bit? And I was like, whoa, how about the guy in Knoxville, right? Uh, uh, Nico, uh, Iamalieva. And you think about George McIntyre and you think about Nico in terms of their frames heading into their senior season. Pretty similar. Um, That being said, Drew, it's not all positive when you go to these events, right? Our our job is to be objective as possible. And I'll tell you this, like from the evaluation standpoint of George McIntyre, this was the equivalent of some cold water being thrown on him. From an arm talent standpoint, I thought it was pretty pedestrian. Um, And then on a windy day, 
when guys like Deuce Knight, uh, guys like Grayson Wilson, guys like Tremel Jones, you can kind of go down the list, kind of separated themselves from the rest of the pack with their arm talent. A guy like George McIntyre really struggled. Um, and not only with the arm strength, but I thought with the command and with the accuracy all day. And then you go back and you look at it and you look at Brentwood Academy, right? And this is a team game. They only won two games last year, right? And we love the we love the physical profile of George McIntyre. I say all that to say this is one exposure point in a very long list of exposure points. But this is ultimately a positive thing for us that now we go back to the board and he's going to be one of those guys. Obviously, we have him ranked as a five-star. You're going to have a little bit of a magnifying glass on him, right, over the next couple months and kind of see how it plays out with him. Um, but certainly a guy versus, like, the on-field evaluation, which I think both you and I really, really like, versus seeing him in a combine setting, it's kind of the tale of two different stories right now. So that's that's where we are with George McIntyre. Well, a couple takeaways here. I mean, disappointing to hear or read it. I, actually, I think you called me <laughs> in the middle of the throwing session. I, look, I, I mean, he's not a camp quarterback. He's not a guy that's been to a ton of these. He doesn't really play seven on seven, which I'm not trying to make some excuses here, but he is a basketball guy. I think the only time I've ever seen him throw on air was at an FIU camp two years ago when he was down in Miami to see his – his uncle, who's the head coach there uh, of the Golden Panthers. So not surprising. I think we said it, you know, when he we put the fifth star on him, okay, this feels weird. I mean, it's a guy that won two games and lost 10 of them. Usually you want to see a winner at that quarterback position, but there are some throws on the tape. I think that deep ball, and I don't think he's been surrounded by the best uh, collection of talent. So, uh, you know, some drops you think about him playing with some other quarterbacks or some other receivers skill players what does that look like uh and then finally coop i love you brought up the nico comparison because i've written the same or thought the same from a body type standpoint kind of how they move it's it's eerily similar yeah it's um it's interesting you know i mean i i, I think a lot of times you come out of these um combine settings and it's kind of hard to be you know, obviously you want to be objective, but you want to be fair, right? And obviously this is a guy that we have ranked in one of the top quarterbacks on our board. Um, but I think if you were to ask George McIntyre himself, I think he would say that he's pretty disappointed. The good thing for him is there's a lot more opportunity uh, for him ahead, especially on the field. And there's a lot more physical growth yet to take place as well. And we talk about the coaching with Deuce Knight. I think you can apply that there with George McIntyre. Uh, two invites went out to the Elite 11 Finals, which will take place in June uh, in Los Angeles, California. The second one, Tramel Jones of Florida State uh, commit and drew a guy that you have a lot of exposure to. And you and I talked about him yesterday as well. He's different than a couple of the other guys that we've already talked about. We talked about Knight. We talked about McIntyre. We're going to talk about Arkansas commit Grayson Wilson here in a second. Those guys are more kind of like prototypical frame developmental upside. Tramel Jones is different in the fact that He's a shade over six feet, and he's hovering around 200 pounds. He's got this strong, compact, sturdy frame, uh, and he doesn't immediately scream quarterback when you see him. Um, that being said, Drew, as a guy that has not studied Tremel so much on the tape side of it, seeing him in person and seeing him operate uh, ball placement-wise, I would say just in terms of consistency throughout the day as well, to go back and look and see that, he only uh, completed, you know, he, his career completion percentage around 58% was a little bit surprising. I think 60% last year as well. That being said, man, like gusty day, and I thought he could pierce through it at all three levels. Uh, so the consistency uh, was something that was really encouraging, and I'm kind of looking to see whether that makes its way to the football field here in the fall. A uh, multi-year starter at Jacksonville Mandarin, same high school that produced Carson Beck, Georgia's starting quarterback, uh, led them to a state finals appearance last year. Last time the Mustangs were there, Beck was under center, and they won a state title in Florida. I, I think the thing for me with Tremel Jones, I mean, he has had an excellent offseason, was great at the Under Armour camp in Atlanta, has flashed at multiple seven-on-seven -seven tournaments. But you kind of dig into the tape, you know, 
live bullets, pass rush. What does that look like? Got a chance to see him uh, in the middle of his junior season, him and Jamie French out there. I, I think the arrow is pointing up. And I think for Florida State, you think about that quarterback room. They bring in Luke Cromenhawk last cycle. This guy appears to be a little higher floor. So I think it makes sense for the Seminoles. Yeah, I, I talked about it uh, yesterday um, on the 24-7 sports football recruiting show. Florida State, Mike Norvell, they've kind of earned uh, the reputation uh, in terms of early talent identification, getting ahead uh, with that quarterback room. They've done a really good job, obviously. They were on it with Luke Cromenhawk. We've talked about that for a while. Uh, Cromenhawk ends up just outside the top 32 last year. So, uh, Drew, last name that I want to bring up, I got a sneeze coming up, so excuse me. <coughs> hey, man, that's why we love this format. Um, Grayson Wilson committed to Arkansas. Um, this kid was uh, pretty interesting. You know, he, he's the one that made me pick up my phone and kind of do some research in terms of reaching out to some people on the other side of the industry and say, hey, what, what's kind of the – What's kind of the uh, story on Grayson Wilson? Nine and three as a starter last year, completed over 67% of his passes, 41 touchdowns, two INTs. He had over 800 rushing yards as well, 15 rushing touchdowns. Drew, you brought it up this morning. You look at that compared to his first two seasons at Central Arkansas, two and 10 record, just below a 60% completion rate. Uh, 25 touchdowns, 15 INTs. So you talk about a guy that has completely flipped that on its head from a production standpoint. The other part of this, 6'3", 195 pounds, multi-sport athlete, uh, decorated both in basketball, baseball. I'm not sure if you have gotten the opportunity to dive in on the film. I think we've all been there where we go to these combines, we see a guy in person, we get kind of googly eyes, and then we go back and we watch the tape and it's not what we think. This was not the case with this kid. I was really, really excited uh, to kind of marry those two together. Um, and really coming out of that, this is a kid for us, Drew, quite honestly, that, you know, when you think about the future, we have him ranked as a three-star kind of in that mid-range is uh, 87 rating. Um, but this is one of those guys, like, excited to kind of keep track of as he heads towards his senior season. Yeah, I love the profile. I mean, you said it uh, helped his team win its first ever basketball state title. That nine and three record best season, I think, in over 10 years for his high school. And then he's also a pitcher. I mean, strikeout type of machine on the mound there at Central Arkansas uh, Catholic. I, you know, I'm fired up about digging into him. And the other thing, Coop, I don't know if you talked to him, right? Committed to Sam Pittman and the Razorbacks. You know, when he committed, Dan Enos was the offensive coordinator. Dan Enos is no longer there in uh, in Fayetteville. He's now an analyst at Florida. Bobby Petrino has taken over, was reading some stories. Okay, you know, they seem to have a good relationship. I'm just, you know, all right, there's going to be quarterback movement. We're going to see it here, you know, as some of these dominoes fall. And then there's going to be a reset in the fall months right before that early signing period. I think he's a name for multiple reasons that people should get familiar with. Number one, you think he can play, all right? He's a guy to track, you know, who knows? Maybe he gets an Elite 11 Finals invite. But there could be change, and someone could be on the market for a quarterback. I thought he had one of the best days of anybody there, you know? And we're talking about George McIntyre there and Deuce Knight there. And obviously there's a lot that gets kind of cooked into um, – how you receive a lead 11 finals invite. But this was one of those guys that um, I left the camp. I was most excited about this kid, you know, and then you look up, he's committed to Arkansas. I kind of like where we have him. It makes sense where we have him. But like in terms of the up arrow, the other thing that I was excited about, he worked out in Dallas last month. And, you know, from those two exposures, seeing him at the elite 11 over the weekend, and then going back and watching the combine tape from Dallas and then marrying that up with the junior tape, like we talk about ascending players all the time. I like where the arrow is uh, with him. So there you have it. Uh, a couple of, uh, I would say, quick summaries uh, on some of the top names there in Oxford over the weekend. Deuce Knight taking home the Alpha Dog honors, uh, also punching his ticket to the Elite 11 finals. That can be said for Tramel Jones as well. The Florida State commit a lot to be excited about there too. Guys, let me mention every Tuesday and Wednesday you can find 
the Oyster Boys on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel. You can also find us on X. Guys, we appreciate you joining the show wherever you are watching, especially on the airwaves too. Make sure to leave a review. And if you're in the chat, you got a question about your favorite team, Andrew and I will answer questions at the end of the show. So make sure to like and subscribe on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel. You can mix it up in the chat as well as our friend Michael, Big Meatloaf, and Canes Cats, the regulars there in the chat as well. All right, Drew, uh, favorite time of the year, the spring games, right? Uh, a lot of, I would say, instantaneous reactions coming from these games. Always enjoyable to see. Uh, but Clemson was in action. Auburn was in action. NC State was in action over the weekend. And it's a really fun time for us, especially uh, the, the people that really have to do the deep dive uh, on these guys at the high school level. And then we get to see uh, really kind of the first – uh, of these guys as they make their way from seniors to freshmen, uh, still navigating the springtime as well. But let's start with Clemson. You watched that game live. I went back through this morning, kind of uh, caught the recap on that. And, Drew, I, I just want to mention, I think you used the term crockpot I, earlier in the show. I and I heard that. Dabo. You, I was wondering where that came from. I didn't think that was a coincidence. I heard that from Dabo Swinney when he was talking about <laughs> Brian Wesco. Um let me say this before we get into Clemson. Dabo Sweeney, I mean, you talk about pure entertainment. The ACC Network had him on the mic on field kind of talking through uh, the entire spring game. Um, not only was it insightful, but, man, uh, you talk about a guy that's got a career in TV waiting for him uh, once his coaching days are done. He's pretty enjoyable there. But, Drew, your overall takeaways uh, from what you saw from the Clemson Tigers this weekend. Well, let's start with Bryant Wesco. And first off, I mean, normally it's like, all right, let him bake in the oven. So I love the crock pot because a little, <laughs> little longer burn there. I'm a, I'm a crock pot guy. I, I do some stuff in the crock pot every, uh, every now and then. Maybe I should say um, throw it in the smoker, throw him on the Traeger, uh, and just let him sit overnight. Uh, Bryant Wesco, Dabo raved about him, had a touchdown catch in the game. Cooper, my instant reaction is, okay, I can't wait for T.J. Moore to step foot on campus there because when we saw Brian Wesco and T.J. Moore in the final exposure point right before, um, you know, at those All-Star games, I thought it was night and day. I mean, T.J. Moore was kind of the story of the Under Armour All-America game, had multiple touchdowns, over 200 yards receiving, playing opposite of Jeremiah Smith. And Brian Wesco for us, I think when we showed up in Orlando, it was we were worried about the frame. And just to me, kind of like my reaction is, yeah, you know, Wesco is going to have the leg up having gone through the 15 spring practices and played in that game. But if they think this about Wesco, I can't wait to hear and see the feedback on TJ Moore. Well, Dabo alluded to it, right? Uh, we just talked about the crock pot. And obviously what he meant by that is that Brian Wesco is going to have to beat up, He's, uh, uh, beef up, excuse me. He's going to have to get in the weight room and, and add some weight to his frame. Um, Drew, I think that's the first thing that stood out to you and I when we saw Brian Wesco in Orlando at the Under Armour game. The other part about this is, you know, he's a narrow frame. Uh, he's very narrow hip, but he's got an explosive lower body. So it's going to take him a little bit of time. That being said, his short area movements, uh, his lower body explosiveness, his ability to play above the rim, I think those are all things that translate immediately. And we kind of saw that um on Saturday in Clemson spring game, um, Drew, the quarterbacks, uh, Klubnik, Vizina, you look at both those guys, Klubnik, 13 of 26, 158 yards, and INT, uh, Vizina. The only reason I pause on Vizina is because I heard a, another pronunciation uh, when I was watching the replay, so now I'm a, I'm a, I'm a little uh, mixed up there, but 14 of 25, 108 yards, two INTs. We'll tie this into uh, together a little bit. The defensive line for Clemson is is really good. Uh, they're really like talented. Really, good. really, really good. Um, you got Peter Woods. You have Tamarian Parker. You got young guys coming on like AJ Hoffler as well. They were wreaking havoc all day. Um, that is going to be a strength of Clemson's defense. Is going to be their defensive line. Ultimately, it's going to be the strength of their team. Uh, is their front seven. On the flip side of that. That kind of sped up the clock for Cade Klubnik, Vizina as well. And you saw those guys kind of struggle. And Klubnik had some bright spots, but there are a couple times he's still putting that ball in harm's way. He had one INT, probably could have been, it was two plays away from being three, right? Um, 
so I'm still pretty fascinated to kind of see kind of what that looks like on offense. Um, and the first thing that I think about is, yes, it's spring. You still have fall camp as well. But they got Georgia week one, right? And you talk about a test for Matt Luke's uh, unit and that offensive line. Um, that's going to be it. They're going to go against one of the best defensive line units in the country in Georgia. That game to me is going to be a really good gut check, barometer check uh, right out of the gates for Clemson. And what we saw early is that they got a lot of work to do uh, to get ready for the Bulldogs. And you brought up the name Matt Luke. I mean, and we have discussed it at length in these airwaves. I think he is the long-term answer to fixing the problem based on how they're recruiting here in the 2025 cycle. Some of the guys I have committed, some of the guys that are going to take official visits uh, in June, you would think the Tigers are going to land a few of them. I, I agree, uh, Coop. Uh, you want to talk about the O-line. What is the long-term outlook at quarterback for the Tigers? I mean, Cade's, Cade's the guy. Uh, he has always been kind of Dabo, uh, the golden retriever for him. But Tigers didn't take an arm in the 24 cycle. They got Blake Herbert committed in the 25 cycle. He only played one game of his junior season. We'll see what he looks like here as a senior. But for a team that doesn't use the transfer portal, I have questions about maybe not 2025, but what does that quarterback room look like in 2026, 2027, and beyond? Because – uh, Bizina, or is it Bizina? Is that, is that was that the another? I have no idea. I gotta I gotta go back to the drawing board. You know what's funny about that? I mean, not trying to take away from the conversation. I met this kid so many times, Same. and had really good conversations with him. And he's a, he's a great kid, and I know he's heard me say his name before, and it's never came up. But you know what, Francis Malanoa was the same way. How long did we say his name wrong before we finally, you know, you go to an ESPN broadcast and you're like, it's Malanoa. Um, besides the point, though, we're going to go with Vizina until we're told differently. I, I just thought it was a discouraging performance from him. So, like, what what is that outlook? I mean, the best quarterback in the game was a, a walk-on from in town, the, the, the third stringer. I wish I knew his name. Oh, I know it because I just looked it up. Trent Pyramid, man, put some respect on his name. Um, to your point, and I mean this in all seriousness, like if I was a Clemson fan and I was looking at that game uh, just in that snapshot – Pierman can do some things, definitely on the ground, too, and he looked pretty comfortable as a passer. So um, I don't know. i got to read into that. Probably need to talk to okay. Anna Adams and kind of see all that. But do, back do, you think, do you think there is a personnel department around the country that saw that game and that name is now on the board? Pierman. Trent Pierman? Yeah, absolutely, 110%. Um, you know, and I went back and I think only had a UAB offer. Um, Dill. Dilfer. You know, and Dilfer coming out. So um, I'll say this. I don't think it was all bad for Vizina. You know, there were some things certainly that he has to clean up. He's a puppy, man. He was pretty incomplete in terms of what you saw at Briarwood C Christian, right? He was this big, physical kid. We felt good about his ability as a runner. Um, but when we saw him in person, he left a little bit to be desired as a passer. I actually thought there were some things – that he did over the weekend that were encouraging. So, you know, what I would what I would say to any Clemson fan is he needs reps. You know, he needs a lot of reps, um, and he's not going to see that with Cade Klubnik. But even getting that exposure over the weekend in that spring game is huge for him, especially going into the fall. Um, so, yeah, it's going to take some time. But I'm with you. I don't, I don't know if you're a Clemson fan sitting there and saying, all right, uh, even post-Klubnik or if something were to happen to Klubnik during the season – this could all kind of fall apart very quickly, right? Um, so we'll see what happens there. Drew, your impressions of uh, five-star linebacker Sammy Brown? <laughs> it's kind of hard to track him. I mean, you're not watching all 22. Uh, eight tackles and a sack. You know, you go back to the high school tape that wasn't asked to blitz a ton, so I think that's encouraging. I mean, he's going to play, right? I, did Dabo have, say anything on him of note? I can't even remember. Uh, I don't remember. I think I, I remember – him you know he had that whether it was a sack or a batted ball or whatever it is I, obviously he is very excited about him you think about Sammy Brown I mean one of the most impact ready players I think of any prospect in the class last year just in terms of where he is physically I'll say this the other thing I liked him a lot more off the edge as a second level blitzer but he also has a lot more on ball ability than I think a lot of people really think about when they think about Sammy Brown. So I love him between the tackle box. It's kind of where he lives. 
But you see how fast he plays and how fast he triggers playing downhill. I mean, if I was Clemson, I'd find a way to kind of u- utilize him situationally uh, in the pass rush, which it seems Wes Goodwin, he's all over that. I mean, I think they're going to move him around and be pretty creative with him. Well, the comp I wanted to put on him is uh, Andrew Van Ginkle. That's who I wanted to comp him to. But then you watch the senior tape, and he's not. there was not a lot of clips of him on the edge. Now, I wish I had put that on there. <laughs> All right, any uh, any final thoughts from Clemson? Uh, look, D-line's good. O-line, I don't know. Uh, fired up for T.J. Moore. I think that sums it up. And Tavoy Fagan, freshman defensive back, picking off a pass. Yeah, you saw that one? I'm, I'm Finished as a four-star for us. Is Klubnik good enough to take them to the promised land? <laughs> I think they have enough top-end talent. I worry about the depth at key positions didn't answer my question, but I think I know what you're saying. Um, I worry about club Nick a little bit. Like I wonder, I wonder if he's, he's going to be good enough to play big enough in those spots, you know? So we'll see. I mean, between the quarterback, the offensive line, a lot of young talent at the receiver position, still got to put it together. The running back room. I don't know. I don't, I don't really have a good feel for it. Um, I don't know if they were banged up this spring or not, but We'll see with Clemson, man. They're going to be one of the more interesting teams uh, to watch. All right, Drew. Auburn uh, and Cam Coleman were stealing all the headlines uh, over the weekend as a five-star. He got to work early. Four receptions, game high, 92 yards as well. Walker White, top 247. Freshman quarterback, 5 to 13, 83 yards. How about this guy, Towns Magoo? Seven Seven for seven on field goals, long of 58. That guy can absolutely boom it. Uh, We don't talk about kickers here a lot, but that's definitely a name to know. Uh, Drew, let's start with the top five player in the country, Cam Coleman. There's been a lot of dialogue about him over the last two weeks as now he kind of uh, already hadn't taken a snap yet, but it almost feels like the country is starting to um, learn about Cam Coleman, you know, coast to coast who this guy is and a lot of expectations uh, for him as a freshman and you know we've talked about it Auburn hasn't had a thousand yard receiver in over 20 years um Cam Coleman pretty different you know it's it's pretty funny you get to the second half of that game and you're watching him and all of a sudden it's like he's not seeing single coverage anymore uh and if DJ Durkin's doing that at halftime of a spring game I would imagine Cam Coleman's going to get that treatment from day one uh with his collegiate career but Drew, uh, there's no other way to say it. He's he's pretty special. All right, so a couple thoughts here. I don't know if you would agree with this. I put it right away in one of our group chats. He looked 15 pounds heavier. I don't know if they're shooting him up with HGH there on the planes. <laughs> uh, no, no judgment. But if you take him at the Under Armour practices in December to when they showed him going through drills for that first part of the scrimmage, I was, I'm like, whoa. I mean – and then you remember the fact he's still 16 years old, Cooper? I think 16, 17. I mean, he is yo- he's young for the grade. Yeah, he's a, he's a puppy. And I, I tweeted about it yesterday. Yeah, yesterday talking about just, you know, had less than, what, 550 yards receiving as a junior. Uh, and then you look at his production as a senior. Uh, physical traits were always there. Um, you know, this is a guy who ran well. Uh, he jumped well. Um, you saw it on tape. The biggest thing from the junior to the senior year was I think he really developed in terms of the route tree at all three levels. Um, And it was a guy that really kind of lived outside the numbers. And if you watch him over the weekend, that's really where he's going to make his hay is going to be in those 50-50 jump ball situations. But at the same time, he can separate as well. Um, You know, so, yeah, he's – He's as advertised and exactly what you thought. I think sometimes you get a little, I don't know, like at least me personally, when you rank receivers that high, I mean, you just got to feel so convicted on them, you know. Um, And then you look at this year, and I think you and I kind of talked about this, the NFL draft, it's a little bit of an outlier, you know, where you got a a Marvin Harrison Jr. and a Malik Neighbors and a Roma Dunze, right? But, you know, for us, Jeremiah Smith, Cam Coleman, you got both those guys in the top five. And as of right now, like there's there's no wins in, you know, spring of 2024. We'll see what this looks like three to four years from now. But, I mean, I feel about as good 
uh, about those two guys as I do as anybody else that we had in the top 32. Well, I think one of the stories of the upcoming college football season is going to be these freshman receivers. And it's not just Jeremiah Smith and Cam Coleman. Um, you know, Micah Hudson's not going through spring practices at Texas Tech, but Joey McGuire keeps hinting, okay, he is going to play as a true freshman. Uh, Steve Sarkeesian at Texas talking up Ryan Wingo. We already went over Bryant Wesco. I think it's a generational group. I really, really do. Uh, Josiah Trader, Nye Carr at Miami. A lot of guys turning some heads, and I think that'll be a theme of the season. And it's going to be spearheaded by Jeremiah Smith and, and Cam Coleman. But go back to this this past year in college football. Who were the, the top freshman receivers? It was Kevin Concepcion, who wasn't a high-profile guy. It was Eric Singleton at or, uh, at Georgia Tech, not really a high-profile guy. I, I think that is going to be – we're going to be a month into the season – and these guys are, are going to be making making plays. And you, you see the clips from Cam Coleman. You see the clips from Jeremiah Smith. And it's like, yeah, we saw them do this in pads as seniors. We saw it at the all-star setting. Cam Coleman, I think it was day two, day three of Under Armour practices. It was a it was an acrobatic act. It was like, what can't he do in, in terms of catch radius, catching anything in his zip code? So, And then he lays out for that 50-yard gain to start the Auburn spring game. I mean, that's a big boy catch. Yeah, and I think we all we often get the question of, like, all right, where do you get the conviction or the validation of, you know, how comfortable you feel when you have to finally stamp uh, that last top 247? And for us, Drew, I mean, that comes from – a good on good setting in these all-star events, right? Whether it's the All-American Bowl, whether it's the Under Armour All-America game, whether it's Alabama, Mississippi, is you get to see good on good. Uh, and Cam Coleman all week in Orlando, just from a competitive temperament standpoint and disposition, uh, the way that he competed. Um, and there were no 50-50 balls, right? It was more 90-10. Uh, so I think, I think you need to add on here. I don't think Cam Coleman actually caught a pass in the actual game. In the, in the Under Armour game, which is why everyone wonders, okay, why do you guys go to practice? Why do you write these updates? You know, we, you say it's one evaluation point. Yeah, it's a week-long evaluation point in the process. It's not just one individual set. Like, I don't think Cam Coleman got to pass that game. How many receptions did Jeremiah Smith have in the All-American Bowl, right? Two. So, same deal. Um, you know, um, other guys that I'm thinking about, like you brought up T.J. Moore, I think T.J. Moore is going to be the name that kind of, um, you know, is going to arrive and, and make a lot of people uh, really excited across college football. You think about T.J. Moore, Brian Wesco, you think about the Clemson of old, what they've had at the receiver position. Um, all right, Drew, we talked about Clemson, we talked about Auburn, and uh, how about NC State? They were in action over the weekend. I did not get to watch this one, but... You texted me some good things from the freshman, Cedric Bailey, the quarterback out of the Florida area, and then Terrell Anderson as well. Late riser for us in the top 247. NC State ends up uh, edging out Georgia there for his services. And, Drew, we're pretty excited not only about Cedric Bailey, but you think about NC State, that receiving core. Uh, you brought up Kevin Concepcion. You got Terrell Anderson. You got Noah, Noah Rogers, Jalen Paler, right, another guy uh, that we really like. So NC State. Uh, influx of some young talent there to be really uh, hopeful about. I'm sipping the Wolfpack Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's because they were in the Final Four. I mean, but what a weekend if you're an NC State fan. You had uh, the women's Final Four, spring game, and then the men's Final Four. Um, Terrell Anderson, kind of, he is what he is what he we thought he is, and I don't know if he's going to be a guy year one for them. Uh, just given that collection of talent. But the story for me in this game, Cedric Bailey, who was Jeremiah Smith's uh, high school quarterback back there at Chaminade Madonna Prep, uh, decorated career. I thought he got better each season uh, and came up big for the Lions in a nationally televised game against Miami Central. That's when uh, I think it was JoJo Trader had a one-handed catch. I mean, uh, he had a 67-yard run. Uh, for uh, I don't think he got in the end zone, and I know it's kind of two hand touch with the quarterbacks, but even if it was full contact, he was still going for 50 yards. I thought it was a really encouraging performance for him. He finished as a high three star for us. You know, there's some conversation about him making a four, earning that fourth star. I think NC State that's their quarterback of the future, and it was funny. 
I don't know who was calling the game. They were like, I, I dug into this kid's film and I loved his release. And I, I think it's unconventional. I would go the other way, but he can spin it. He can get the job done. And uh, them getting him on campus for spring practices was a big deal, right? You got Grayson McCall this upcoming year. I think they're going to make a push. And then Cedric Bailey, kind of the guy of the future. Yeah, live arm, long frame, right? When you talk about the developmental upside, some of those guys you just don't know in a very positive way, right? If, if they can put it together. Cedric Bailey, I believe, drew over 70% completion rate last year. Helps when you're throwing the ball to uh, the number one player in the country, uh, not to mention JoJo Trader, too, right? Well, yeah, the other thing is, you know, he would run a little bit at Shamanad Madonna, but there was never a 70 yard run in the arsenal. Last line of my scouting report on him was like, athletic profile suggests he could always get a look at tight end. And, you know, some people might think that's a, a swipe at him. I, I was just trying to hint that we haven't seen the athlete be the athlete on the field. And, and now we're seeing a little bit of it at NC State. All right, guys, I talked about Tuesday and Wednesday. You can find the 24-7 Sports Football Recruiting Podcast, noon Eastern time, 11 o'clock Central. You can find us on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel. Guys, if you have a question there, we'd love for you to do it on the YouTube channel. Make sure to like and subscribe. Also, if you're on X, you can ask a question there. We'll get the questions at the end of the show. But guess what, guys? We also have the transfer portal coming up, and we have 24-7 Sports Live. That's on Thursday. 5 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, great programming there by 24-7 Sports. So make sure to tune in there. But, Drew, um, the transfer portal, that does open on April 16th, the second window. And those names already uh, are starting to file in. And how about Ohio State running back, Dallin Hayden, number 226, number 19 running back in 2022. Well, he's planning on entering the portal. A uh, quick snapshot on him, 215 snaps as a freshman. Only 60 as a sophomore in 2022, over 100 carries for 553 yards, five touchdowns. 2023, 19 carries, 110 yards and a touchdown. Crowded running back room. You think about Travion Henderson coming back uh, to Columbus. Quinshaw Judkins, one of the best running backs in the country, joining him from Ole Miss. And then there's Dallin Hayden, um, who had some really, I don't want to say interesting comments, but I think they asked him about, you know, his outlook on the running back room and what that looks like. He had a really mature answer just about keeping his head down, uh, continuing to work and trust the process. Well, the process has led him here to the portal. And quite honestly, Drew, I I can't blame him. Um, And you go back and you watch Dallin Hayden. I mean, this is a guy that is really a plug and play player. I mean, these are the guys that are really hard to come by uh, in this second window. And I talked to a general manager today uh, at a Power 4 program, and I asked him, and I said, hey, what, it, what do you expect from this second window? What, what is the goal here for your program? And he says, I think there are going to be a lot, of, a lot of teams out there chasing starters. You know, you're really looking for uh, your third, fourth, fifth guy on the depth chart uh, and trying to a- address some depth and maybe some break glass in case of emergency type of situation. So, Dallin Hayden, um, obviously I would say the result of Ohio State doing some really good running back recruiting. Um, But Drew, you think about potential fits out there. Tennessee has come up. Ole Miss has come up. Um, Originally, I thought Missouri, I checked in on them. They brought in two transfers, one from App State, one from Georgia State. Um, Oregon kind of comes to mind a little bit just because you can never know with them. Um, But Drew, if there was – A leader in the clubhouse, at least just from like me reading the tea leaves, you look at Ole Miss, you look how much they've invested in the 2024 roster. They bring in Logan Diggs from LSU who's coming off an ACL injury. Outside of that, they don't have much. Keidra Criscano, young running back, very talented, not a lot of experience. I would expect the Rebs uh, in the absence of Quinshawn Judkins, ironically, um, to pursue Dallin Hayden uh, with everything they got. This is free agency. <laughs> I mean, it feels like NFL free agency. You, you said it, plug and play type of guy. Uh, that's what we're doing. Contenders are trying to add pieces right here. I want to know if this, if, if he does go to Ole Miss, you know, is there any extra compensation that 
Ohio or Ole, the Ole Miss gets. I mean, are we going to get to the point where there's just trades if we go to like a collective bargaining agreement, Cooper? Is that is that in the works? At some I have point no idea. You, you brought that up. I mean, quite honestly, when it comes to the portal and everything that's happened from a legislation standpoint and you have everything going on and, uh, you know, with these court cases, I cannot keep up. Yeah. I don't know what applies today. I don't know what applies tomorrow. I don't know uh, what's in the hopper in terms of what's being – uh, debated on. Um, I have so, no idea, you know. So Ohio State gets Quinchon Judkins, Ole Miss gets Dallin Hayden, and then like a top two, four, seven back end <laughs> linebacker yeah. or something. Yeah, you keep the, you you love talking about those comp picks. I don't think the comp picks will arrive in college football, but uh, uh, just other a thing, guess. I think the other thing you got to note here with Hayden, uh, new running back coach in Columbus. Uh, you got to bring that up, right? Tony Alford out. Uh, you know, something to keep an eye on. All right, another name uh, that entered the portal this morning, Miami Edge, Nigel Lee Kelly, number 87 overall in 2022, number 11 defensive lineman. He plans to enter the portal. Uh, Drew, you go back, you look at Kelly. He appeared in five games, making three starts this past season, six pressures uh, on 61 pass rushing snaps. Uh, also played in 12 games as a freshman, 19 tackles, four sacks, pass breakup. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, and this is a guy that uh, you've had a lot of exposure to covering the state of Florida. Nigel Lee Kelly was one of those guys that ended up in the top 100 for us and ended up number 87. And I think I felt like, all right, we got him at 87, uh, but he could be one of those guys at the end of the day that makes us look wrong in a very positive way. Correct? Like, I, I think this was a guy that – I had a lot of conviction in one day uh, outperforming his current grade projection, uh, which was a top 100 player. Two years later, um, you can say, all right, you know, four sacks. He's played 12 games as a freshman. He played a little bit as a sophomore. Uh, I think dealt with an injury, right, uh, at, at later on in the season. Um, you turn on the tape, and obviously from a height, weight, speed standpoint, Everything that you liked about Nigel Lee Kelly coming out of high school is still there. That being said, the on-field development in terms of this guy being a proactive versus a reactionary pass rusher, um, he looks a little lost in space. He doesn't strike at the point of attack. I think he gets washed out too easily against the run. There are some flashes there uh, that are encouraging that ultimately at the end of the day, I think there's going to be more than a handful of programs that are going to look at the physical clay in stature of Nigel Lee Kelly and say, you know what, we can make it work. The other part about this is the expectations have changed, right? I don't think maybe people look at Nigel Lee Kelly and say, hey, this is a guy that can give me six, seven sacks a year. But, you know, this is a guy that can come in here, at least be a warm body for us uh, in a winnable level starter. And I think that's kind of where we are with him. Yeah, some thoughts here. I mean, leaving Jason Taylor or not taking it a technique. The next step with his technique with Jason Taylor, I mean, Hall of Fame there, Hall of Famer there in Miami. I think that's a bit concerning. Um, and I think the shoulder injury, you know, dealt with it as a senior in high school. I think he got it cleaned up. And then that's what derailed the, the sophomore campaign this past year. I, I think with Nigel Leak, you said it. I mean, the traits are still there. He's got an 80-inch wingspan. You go back to his testing numbers from there in high school. Excellent in the short area quickness with that L drill um, and the short shuttle. Just hasn't come all together. I don't know if he's an impact guy in 2024. And I think he's someone that's going to need – Need some time before he can reach that potential. Interested to see what the market is for him. You know, I heard his name come up from a few college contacts last week, and I heard there was a huge price tag attached to it as well. What's interesting about Nigel Lee Kelly, if you want to compare everything to the NFL, these guys are like the equivalent of like cats. They have nine lives, right? When you talk about pass rushers, they're just going to get opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. You talk about the price tag, maybe that scares some people away. I'm not sure what his situation was in Miami. Um, you know, but this is going to be the interesting part, right? This is the interesting part of the portal experiment is, yeah, you had a guy that was ranked inside the top 100. First two years, it's a mixed bag at best, right? And the production is lacking. Whose side of reality wins, 
right in the free agent market is going to be the really interesting one. So we'll see what happens. Well, it's it's just like free agency. It's didn't extend, didn't put the franchise tag. Canes, uh, Canes, Cats, Heat, three hundred five. Um, see in the chat. You asked, how can he have a high price tag if he's done absolutely nothing? He wasn't even going to start in Miami. I can understand that question, but that that's not the reality of the situation. The reality of the situation is a lot of these guys are being paid sight unseen for their physical ability, uh, physical ability of what they can do. Now, whether or not uh, that has materialized to Miami's expectations, I can't speak on that. Um, but this is the reality of the world that we're living in now, right? Um, this is what swings recruitments. Right? I think the other thing you got to think about is like Nigel Lee Kelly was a big in state win for Mario Cristobal, I believe, his first couple weeks on the job. Right? And if you're Mario Cristobal and they hire you from Oregon and your reputation is as a recruiter, what better way to do that than win that type of recruitment? Um, there's perception value in this stuff too, you know? So, yeah, maybe the long term payout is not what you think, but. Winning that recruitment in terms from a momentum standpoint, absolutely, you know. All right, Drew, let's go to the uh, high school uh, side of things. And Matt Zollers, Zollers in a dream, as I like to call him, number 62 player, overall number six quarterback, picks Mizzou last week. And, um, you know, you talk to Tom Loy, you talk to some other people around the recruitment, Georgia, Missouri, Penn State, Pittsburgh, all involved. And... Seems to be a lot of respect for how Matt Zollers kind of handled this, and this was very close to the vest. I don't think a lot of people knew really up until decision time. Tom told us that he felt like it was Missouri, ends up being Missouri. Um, you know, we've heard some things about Missouri doing a good job in terms of what they've uh, presented to Zollers in his camp from an NIL standpoint. Back to my point on Nigel Lee Kelly. That's just the world that we're living in now. Um, Drew, you and I have talked about this with Zollers you know, we talked about the route that Missouri took and put NIL aside. They were the one program in all of the top contenders that Matt Zollers was considering that said, you're our guy. There's no 1B. There's no other quarterback. There's no Beckham Kritza. There's no Julian Lewis. There's just you. Um, and that ultimately at the end of the day, I do think that means something. This is a this is a big, big win for Mizzou, and I think it kind of, you know, if you know, you know, right? If, you, if you're watching us 52 minutes into the show, you know it's a big win. But maybe if you're not really paying attention, you're an SEC fan in early April, and you're kind of like, oh, Missouri picks up a four-star commitment from Matt Zollers. What does that really mean? I like this one a lot. I think this kid's a, a player. I think he fits the system uh, for Drinkwitz, what they want to do. You think about the receivers. I mean, Brady Cook ran for like 500 yards last season. Matt Zollers is a better athlete than Brady Cook. And I think Missouri going all in on him was such a smart play. Big risk, but it paid off. And I wrote about it like you need to take Missouri serious. I know they just had this double-digit win season, took down Ohio State. What was that, uh, the Sugar Bowl? I can't even remember which one. Cotton Bowl? One Cotton of those Bowl. games. Yeah, New Year's Six game. But I kind of love their recruiting class. We we gave them plenty of roses in that 24 cycle for what they did. Williams and Winery, James Brown, Courtney Crutchfield. And then they open it up with, with some fireworks here in the, in the 2025 cycle, also in it for Javon Boggs. I just think new, new landscape of the SEC. Missouri's going to be a pest as long as Drinkwitz is recruiting like this. All right, a couple, uh, one more SEC commitment and one that happened over the weekend that I thought was like in my area. Uh, excited to talk about it on the show. Talib Graham, number 29 edge rusher in the country. He commits to Ole Miss on Sunday. Drew, I like this kid um, just in terms of the type of player that Ole Miss is getting and what they're doing on the defensive line. Uh, 46 tackles, 18 TFLs last year, seven sacks as well. You think a little bit about the profile of Talib Graham. Uh, got to see him in Atlanta, six one and a half, two hundred and forty pounds, hovering around there. Uh, he's got a six foot five plus wingspan, thirty four inch uh, vertical, ran four seven three. Like 
is he going to check all the boxes in terms of what you're looking for, like from a prototypical 3-4 stand-up edge rusher? No. Uh, is this a guy that plays faster and bigger than his size and his frame? Absolutely. Um, and everything I talked about with Nigel Lee Kelly kind of being one of those guys that's more of a reactionary athlete, what I mean by that is sometimes the eyes are big. It's a little bit deer in headlights, and you're trying to react as quickly as you process this kid is not one of those guys. Uh, he is a proactive mover. He plays with a game plan. Everything that he does, he's incredibly instinctive um, off the edge. And although he might not be dripping with athletic upside, there is enough in him physically. I mentioned the lower body explosiveness that you can get really, really excited about. And this was like super, super savvy kind of pickup for Ole Miss, in my opinion. Oh, I love it. I mean, we always bring up Ole Miss's recruiting, them being in the transfer portal. I would assume at the end of the cycle, Tlaib Graham is is not, you know, one of their top five ranked players in the class. He's going to be closer to the back end. And if this is the floor of the class, then I'm excited about them. I think he's got ready to play size. I mean, unique build. He's piped, piped up. He's inflated and very muscular. You said that lower explosion. I thought he was an instant eye catcher at the Under Armour camp there in Atlanta. And it is a savvy move for Ole Miss going into Alabama uh, and getting that done because he's a guy that can play for the Crimson Tide. He's a guy that can play, you know, for the Tigers. So I like it. You have to have a vision with him, and I, I assume the Rebels do. All right. Miami fans, Miami fans in the chat, we always get a lot of love from the Miami fans, guys. We appreciate you. Miami now up to number 17 in the rankings after they added a commitment from four-star tight end Luca Gilbert, the number 16 tight end in the country, out of the state of Ohio. He committed to the Canes on Monday. Drew, you like this kid a lot uh, when you think about kind of what he offers, Six foot eight, over 230 pounds. He's got an 80-inch eight, wingspan. Um, he's an interesting guy uh, because, at least in my opinion, he's not the type of guy that is going to get – a lot of headlines in terms of what he offers as a pass catcher. Only had 15 catches for 171 yards last year, two tutties as well. But when you think about Miami, what they want to do, we obviously know the emphasis that Mario Cristobal puts on the offensive line. They're going to be in a lot of 12 personnel. I like this kid. Uh, and Luca Gilbert's one of those guys. Like He's going to cover a lot of people up. He's 6'8", 230. He's got the basketball background. He's going to play at 265, right? I mean, he, he's going to be able to put on 25, 30 pounds of weight. Uh, and in terms of what you're looking for in a very old school, traditional Y tight end, this is what he is, right? He has a role. He's going to fill that out. And ultimately, at the end of the day, if you're talking about NFL potential, the same value that they offer at college, they offer at the NFL. They You need these guys. Is he going to be a tight end one? No, because of his lack of pass catching ability. Is he going to be a second or third guy that you want in your room? Absolutely. So in that context, I really like what Miami's doing here. So I think I'm maybe the highest on him out of everyone at 24-7 sports. I, I see the vision. He's a beanpole. Like he is, he is lean. He is lanky. And usually when you come across these kids in high school, they are split out wide just primarily perimeter pass catchers. He is not that at all. They attach him in line work, utilize him a little bit as a lead blocker, H back. Um, and he blocks his butt off and against Ohio based competition, you know, doesn't run a ton of routes. Isn't going to blow you away with his speed, but I see the long-term picture with him. Go back to the 2023 NFL draft three, of the tight end selected over six foot six. I mean, you can't teach his size. And I love the fit at Miami. Uh, Elijah Lofton, you know, undersized tight end, playing some running back. He's making some headlines this spring. And now they're going to get a guy that's the complete opposite. You know, they're building out this, this offense with different types of bodies, and that allows them to get creative. I like it. Kind of reminds me, for Miami fans, if you had to find a comp like Will Mallory, you know, Will Mallory wasn't as big, probably a better athlete. But I think you can do the same things, leak them out of the backfield. They kind of have a similar stride. So uh, I think Miami's about to get pretty hot here on the recruiting trail, and I like this pickup. There you go. So Missouri, Ole Miss, Miami uh, in the headlines this week. Also, the portal. Guys, we got to be uh, 
I would say we have to be adaptable in everything that we do. So if you hear us talking a little bit more portal over the next couple of weeks, you understand that's that's the name of the college game. It's a roster management, player personnel driven show. That's what we're going to talk about. So a lot more uh, of those conversations to come ahead. I would love to get Matt Zinnitz back on the show, man. One of the best in the business. Pair him up with Tom Loy. Be a uh, nice little time. Guys, before we get to questions, Portal Palooza. Love to tie that in together. April 16th, Tuesday. Coverage begins at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. CBS HQ 24-7 Sports YouTube channel. We'll be breaking it down from 9 a.m. Eastern to 12 o'clock noon. And uh, going to be me. Carl Reed, Smoke Dixon, Matt Zinnitz, Chris Hummer, Andrew Ivins. going to be a whole cast of characters breaking down all of the transfer portal transactions throughout the early morning. So we hope you can join us. And uh, with that being said, time to answer some questions. And Drew, let's start with our boy Rod Smith. He says, Andrew, are prospects slow playing Florida because of the uncertainty of Billy Napier? I think this is a, a great question. So I know producer Sanle brought it up. Want to hear your take, Cooper? But I think Florida's in a sticky spot here, right? Um, the recruits, the families can hear the noise in terms of all right, what what is take the temperature on on Billy Napier's seat? How the season went wasn't ideal, and look at that recruiting class. Florida was pacing to sign a, a top five, top three group. We loved a lot of those individuals, and there was a stretch there where there was a ton of defections, and, and there really wasn't a ton of additions. Now, some of the, the plan Bs for the Gators they got in 24 I like. Um, you know, Greg Smith, defensive back, finishes a four-star for us. The running back, Jaden Baugh uh, out of Georgia. I like those two. But I think Florida's in a spot where you got to kind of move, move quietly and – I know right now where they sit in Cooper, 29th in the rankings. Not, I know they're not in the top 25. But you look at the June visitors list, got some big names coming. Um, and I think for Florida, really, on field, what happens week one against Miami is going to set the tone potentially for this recruiting class. But they're in a tough spot. I mean, tough spot just given the optics. Still, like some of the expected visitors, I mean, Keelan Russell, obviously favorite of the show. I mean, Solomon Thomas expected to get in there. Um, you know, I don't think all is lost. Malik Autry, another guy that's going to visit. Yeah, the good the, the good thing about Florida and Gainesville, and regardless of how it works out with Billy Napier, uh, if it does work out or if it doesn't work out, he, he's done a – Good job, in my opinion, at least from the high school side in terms of building that roster. I mean, there's there's a lot there that I think Florida fans can be hopeful uh, about. Um, Drew, what I would say about Florida in their situation, I mean, I think you got to look at Florida State really as an example, right? I think Mike Norvell was under a lot of pressure going into year three. Um, and Mike Norvell was a guy that, quite honestly, um, you know, I was pretty critical of, of going into year three, whether or not he was going to be up for that job. He did some things um, behind the scenes. You know, they hired Derek Gray from Oregon State. We've talked about him on this show. And they just kind of trusted the process, you know. And then year three comes, what was it, 10, 10 plus wins, right, for Florida State and Mike Norvell. And you think about Florida, if he can piece together some hope, right? And I don't know what hope means. What What's that magic number, right? Whether it's DJ Lagway maybe showing you something in the second half of the season that you can build around him. And it's a eight, nine win team uh, that can go win in the postseason. If, if, if you can sell that, if you can put that together on the field, then I think Florida's in a really good spot. Uh, but I do agree to go back to the question itself. Absolutely. Is there going to be some uncertainty, you know? Um, can I- w- when you're recruiting, you have to balance that out. It's not all equal, right? Um, you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you're going to have to continue to reevaluate things and what's best for your future year over year, right? And I think right now that's kind of where Florida finds themselves. Do you think there is some uh, powers that be that are also maybe a little more uh, cautious right now at this stage in terms of the people that support Florida football? I think you get what I'm hitting at. I think so. You know, um, you know, we talked about NIL and we talked about the people that are investing. And ultimately, at the end of the day, you want to see the return on investment. It's hard to continue to spend your own money on something that is not producing. 
right? So you want to see that investment produce. Um, and it is put up or shut up time for Florida in Gainesville. Simple as that. Like they got to win football games. That's what it comes down to. So great question, Rod. We appreciate that. Um, living rent free in UT. Always good for uh, some good questions. He said, thoughts on Ryan Wingo. Word is he's tearing it up during Texas spring practice practices. Recruits uh, in Austin also raved about him. Uh, and he mentions DK Moore, Jamie French, and Kalik Lockett. Um, Drew, I have not read in too much on Ryan Wingo. Um, I know you brought it up earlier in the show, the five-star receiver out of St. Louis who Texas beat Missouri for. Um, what do you think? I mean, just in terms of the type of impact that he can make as a freshman. Because he was, he was a guy that we were always pretty bullish on, had ranked very high. And then we got to see, what, 19 of the top 20 receivers and, you know, uh, a month before signing day, all in person. Um, and as it shook out, I think we still love the idea of Ryan Wingo. I think we calib- we recalibrated a little bit. I think we tucked him in at number 31 and kind of said. No, you finished us 32. 32. It went from like, okay, this guy, immediate impact. Physically, the traits are different, and I believe they are, and that's maybe what we're seeing so far in spring practices. Um, But there's still a little bit more uh, in terms of the on-field development that we need to see, right? Um, But My my takeaway is go back to the All-American Bowl. Came in at 210 pounds. I thought he was ready to play size. Aside from the other receivers there like Jeremiah Smith and, and Jordan Shipp, I, I, I thought I was like, this guy could be on a college roster right now. Now, I'm surprised that Sarkeesian has come out and said this and there's all this. Trey Scott, I mean, our editor is the first one that put it on my radar. I was kind of like, whoa, all right, I, I got to dig into this on Wingo. I mean, I think he can be a complimentary piece year one. I don't think he's going to be, you know, wide receiver type one. But it goes back to the theme, Cooper. We we're talking about this this crop of receivers in in 2024. I mean, go all the way down. Like, I'm scrolling through the rankings. Like, Jordan Ship was 19. Terrell Anderson was 20. Nike Carr was 21. Like, all those guys could play uh, early on. So, I, I think if you're a Texas fan, it's very encouraging that Ryan Wingo has found his bearings this early, and I think that is a a sign of what's to come. His height, weight, speed was unique one of the only guys that scored a, a 5.0 in the in the pai for tracking football one of the only guys with a, a perfect 5.0 score he was on my freaks list and i thought him in the return game there uh where in high school always stood out to me just how he reversed fields yeah like i like i said earlier in the show i mean we're listen it, spring ball um i forgot last year there was an example of somebody that we talked about during spring ball that really didn't freshman year didn't amount to much um so you got to be careful there a little bit but from what drew is is saying about wingo i think we had him at what like six foot two plus two two ten right yeah at the all-american bowl and you talk about a guy that went mid ten fives right on the 100 meter that combination of size with that speed is rare um so in terms of the things that need to catch up technically as a route runner, his ability to uh, create consistent separation off the line of scrimmage or at the top of the route, that will come. That 6'2", 210 frame running at a 10-foot-5 pace still allows you to be utilized on the field early, right? Like you can do some things with that. Uh, so not surprised uh, to hear Ryan Wingo's name. It's going to be interesting uh, to kind of see where he fits in the offense. Um, all right, Drew, one of the last questions we'll answer here from Kane's Cats. He says, Andrew and Cooper, what players are catching your eye that will move up or potentially move down in the rankings update? Uh, we'll try to stay on the positive side here. Um, <laughs> I will say Kane's Cat, let me give you some, um, let me give you some context. We have been working over time, our entire scouting team on the 2026, uh, Top 247 update as we expand from 100 to 247. So I'm going to take your question. I'm going to change it a little bit and then give you a layup, Drew, here. Is there a 2026 
no, as no. we go from 100 to 247. No, we don't have to do that. I mean, I have spent. I base all I base all these questions off your facial reactions, just so you know. <laughs> I'm just if I watch one more 2026 prospect, I might. <laughs> it might be the end of me. <laughs> no, let's let's stick with. Uh, I, I got next shin pulled up. Let's stick with. I was buying you time is what I was doing. Yeah, let's stick with 25. Uh, you go first. <laughs> Come on, man. All right, give me one second because I know exactly who it is, but I just want to make sure I get the name right. Um, we've talked about him on the show. How about Radarius Jackson from Tennessee? Okay. Yep, a little bit of a, a basketball background, a guy that we have rated um, – believe is a high three star right now that could change soon but um explosive dynamic plays above the rim two-way snaps kind of reminded me a little bit of courtney crutchfield i love him um and everything we've heard collegiate feedback wise has kind of mirrored that so that would be one guy certainly i got it i got one i, I don't know if we Excuse talked me. about him on this uh on this show and i i think we should you know be transparent here right i mean we're always watching tape a lot of these guys, you'll you'll write them up, and it's like, okay, need to see him. What does he measure at Under Armour Baltimore or Under, or Under Armour New Jersey? And those camps are in the coming weeks. But one guy I have circle, uh, Darren Kennebong. I mean, he was up to moved up to number eighty four overall for us. Big frame defensive lineman out of the state of New Jersey. Young for his grade. He wrestles. I think that's a guy that you know you could strap a rocket to his back. I think you used that analogy earlier, and he's got you know, top 32 potential. So he's one where it's like we like him or we study, you know, got to see another exposure point to kind of stamp that. Who else you got, Coop? Anyone else? Yeah, what about JV and Campbell? Big boy from Kentucky. Um, defensive lineman that we oh, like. Yes. I know we've reevaluated here recently. Um, only played football for one year. I believe they had 14 and a half sacks as a junior. Um, you know, guy that we'd love to see in person, but even just watching them on tape, it's, you know, when you see some of these guys that have that inexperience and then they step on a football field and they look like they've been playing for three years um, and then they have everything else to go along with it as well. Certainly one of those guys, Greg Biggins, got to give him a shout out. How about Tristan Castro, right? Um, corner from Upland High School as well. Um, certainly somebody that, that we like and Give USC a lot of credit, man. I've been I've been very um, tough on them over the last couple of years, and I don't, their lack of attention on the West Coast. And I just this is more of what they need uh, is a kid like Castro, and I love him and kind of what he brings to the table. I got one more because um, I wrote him up before the show. Caleb Singleton, corner out of uh, the Jacksonville area, brother of Sam Singleton, Florida State running back. Just ripped off a wind aided 10 5 4 6 1 corner. Um, I know we were asked about Florida. He's he's got an official visit set up to Florida. I don't know if he's a top two four seven guy, but height, weight, speed. Um, and then you dig into what he did at Under Armour Orlando. Okay, this guy can play off man. So that's that's another guy for me. All right, last question here because I want to get a I want to get ahead of this. Um, Michael, Dallas fan. Always love you stopping by, man. You say elite eleven quarterback Deuce Knight better be moving up to a five star. <laughs> I just want to get ahead of this. We always talk about it, right? There are multiple, multiple data points throughout the evaluation process, and this was one data point for Deuce Knight that was a positive, and he was the alpha dog. And let me say this: he was good. Everything you wanted to see from a trait standpoint, it was there. He wasn't perfect. It wasn't one of the best throwing exhibitions I've seen. You know, this is a guy, when you talk about the player, he's got the tools and he's got the physical traits. And we always talk about projection. That's what it is. We have him in this day three category for a reason. Because there are things on the field that need to continue to mature. Areas that he needs to get better. The footwork has got to take a big leap. The lack of continuity he had last year going from Lipscomb back to his high school in Mississippi. I mentioned he completed 50% of his passes. There are things that we love about Deuce Knight. We think the ceiling is very high. Um, that being said, to completely ignore that based off of one data set uh, or data point at the Elite 11 Oxford, 
just you, you can't apply that uh, and say, okay, now we're, we're ready to go. We've seen what we needed to see. When we talk about the projection and we talk about the production, especially as it pertains to quarterbacks, this is kind of the balancing act of them both. Like, And I wrote it in the article yesterday. He, in my opinion, is the most intriguing quarterback prospect in the class because he's got one of the highest floors, if not the highest, and he's got, excuse me, one of the highest ceilings and one of the lowest floors, right? Let me be very careful with that. So a guy like Deuce Knight, it's been a lot of peaks and valleys. You just want to see some consistency, right? So um, I like Deuce Knight. You know, I've already, people are already tweeting about, you know, him potentially seeing a bump in the rankings, all that type of stuff. Like, there's a lot more we need to see. That being said, hopefully that explains it and adds some context to the situation. You said it on the front end of the show, right? This is the best you've seen him because how would you describe him at UA Atlanta? Inconsistent. Inconsistent every time I've seen him, you know, which is the whole – and which the other is the thing. whole deal. He's the type of guy, like, if we're in the NFL circles, he either makes you look really smart or he gets you fired. You know? Um, and I have said this. Notre Dame, you know, is in a perfect position with Mike Denbrock, Marcus Freeman, to take Deuce Knight and just let him develop. And if that's the expectation then you have a great situation for him to step into in South Bend. And, you know, that's just kind of my, my thought on him. I'm not trying to take anything away from him. He's just got a lot of meat left on the bone that we have yet to see come to fruition. We also compared him to kind of the DJ Lagway. Remember DJ Lagway coming out of the Elite 11 finals was not the best of performances. We decided to keep him where we were in the rankings. And he, where did he finish in the top five for us? Like – Number three. There's a method to the madness. I mean, what if we shoot Deuce Knight up and then he goes out to the Elite 11 finals and has a terrible week and then has a good senior season? It's, it's going to be like... Burp, burp, burp. Yeah, right? well, it's not It's not even that. We want to see it on the field, right? Like, we've talked about this. DJ Lagway showed some flashes at the Elite 11 finals, but how would you... If you had one word to describe his performance last summer, what would it be? Hmm. I only get one word. Just try. It's an exercise. <laughs> I don't know. I'm searching. All right. You get multiple words. I'll peaks give you a valleys. sentence. Yeah, peaks, peaks and, and valleys. valleys. But then he goes on to his senior season and he answers every question, um, you know, in that setting, which is the most important setting for a quarterback to be able to answer those questions. Right. So that's what's important. That's what's important with Deuce Knight. Um, Michael follows up. He said he's Lamar Jackson. He's rare. He's not going to be easily explained. Lamar Jackson is Lamar Jackson. Mm-hmm. You know, we haven't seen Lamar Jackson since. You know, we've we've thrown around some guys that maybe remind us a little bit of Lamar Jackson. Um, you know, but in terms of Deuce Knight as a runner, I think he had over 350 yards rushing last year. You know, so I think he is more passer than he is runner at this point. So, Deuce Knight, no shortage of context on him. Um, I don't want anybody to think I'm a hater on the kid. I'm not. I, I'm extremely fascinated uh, by his talent. Um, All right, and, trivia. Yeah. Who, which which top two four seven quarterback has ran for the most yards? Can I take a look at the list real yeah. quick? All right. Sorry, as I, I move career, around here. Career yardage. All right, let me tell you in my head the guys that I'm thinking of. You have Underwood, um, Zollers, Russell, I remember was surprising. Um, Russell's 540 or 64. He's, he's uh... Ooh, Malik Washington, I have not dove into at that degree. Um, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to go with Zollers. It's Ty Hawkins. Yeah. 2,000 yards, 9.3 yards per carry. 
TCU commit. Yeah. No. I, was, uh... It's all good. I did see some stuff on Haas Haney at TCU and his spring practices. <laughs> Haas Haney, man. I'm excited about him. He's a dude. Um, all right, brother. That's all I got. You got anything? I'm, I, I'm out. All right, guys. We appreciate you uh, joining us today. Also, like I said all the time, make sure to like and subscribe to the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel for Andrew Ivins. I'm Cooper Patagna. Tom Loy, National College Football Reporter, will be joining us tomorrow. So if you have any questions, especially, you know, I see some Zion Grady chat um, in the chat uh, about where he might be going. Um, Tom Loy, that is the guy to ask. So we'll have him on the show. Probably a little bit more portal talk as well. Like I said, for the DOS, I'm Cooper Batagna. Same time tomorrow. We'll see you then.